It's great to be joined today by John Johnson, an MIT PhD who runs an econometrics consultancy in Washington, D.C. He's also co-author of Every Data, the misinformation hidden in the little data you consume every day. Uh, it's so great to talk to you. I think a good way to maybe jump into this is with all of the political polling that's going on and questions and thoughts about can we trust polls that don't poll cell phones or what does the margin of error really mean? Let's just start there. When we see a political poll that says Hillary plus 10 over Trump nationally and another that says Trump plus four over Hillary nationally, how can the average person be sort of uh, 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 moderately well equipped to look at a poll and figure out what we can deduce from it? Well, it's hard. And so the first thing you have to do is you can't overread any single poll. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes I think the media makes is they're trying to tell stories and narratives every day. And so you get these data points, a brand new poll today that has an interesting result suddenly turns into an entire storyline. And that can really cause a lot of problems. First of all, if you were trying to be a better consumer of polls, first thing I would try to remind people to do is remember what the polls are trying to suggest is they're trying to predict the voting patterns of what is ultimately going to be millions of people with a hundred to a thousand people and that's an actual really hard statistical problem so if the types of questions they ask are slightly biased or suggestive in a way that might affect the results if they ask the wrong people uh, any of those things can affect the actual results so what i always do is first i try to look at how many people were sampled just to see the raw numbers. That's just a helpful metric. And then you often, you mentioned the margin of error. The margin of error is just one type of bias that we can find in polls. The idea that you're trying to predict the voting patterns of millions of people with just a few thousand or a few hundred even, what that margin of error tells you is how statistically confident we are that the result, the real result, in other words, if you've polled every single person, how statistically confident are the result we got from our poll is actually close to that. So what I look at is the margin of error, how big or small that is. And then I just try to look across a range of different polls to just sort of see what the different numbers are looking like. Um, ultimately, there is information to be gleaned, but you just have to be very careful and thoughtful to not overinterpret the numbers. OK, so let's go through a few of these items piece by piece, and I think this will be really interesting. When you talk to pollsters, they will often give a convoluted but seemingly well-intentioned answer about sample size where they say once you get beyond assuming you have the right sort of distribution and a representative sample that once you get beyond <laughs> some will say 800 a thousand 1200 respondents that you are not going to be better or have more accurate results than when you if you were to double or continue increasing the sample size. Is that true? And if so, how is it backed up mathematically? OK, well, actually, it's mathematically true with respect to only one type of error, and that's what we call sampling error. What they are right truly as a matter of math is that if you believe you have the sample right and you have a truly representative sample, then to eliminate the type of error which comes from the fact that we just can't ask every single person, that's why that or how that margin of error gets smaller and smaller. And it is absolutely true that as you go from 1,000 to 2,000 to 5,000, the decline in the margin of error gets smaller and smaller. But where I think it's a little bit misguided and perhaps off is that with all those other types of errors that are really important, non-response bias, representativeness, how much are the people that you're talking to actually representative of the broader population? With respect to those other things, I think you can get increases in accuracy by polling more people. So it kind of plays off of a very common mistake that people make. Margin of error is just about one type of bias or error in a sample or poll, but there are many others that actually are often far more important. And by taking or getting more data, we usually always think as statisticians and economists, the more data the better if we can get more data and it's cost effective, which is really what it comes down to, then we probably prefer it and could get better answers.
OK, as far as margin of error, many understand margin of error to mean the following. If we have a poll that has Hillary Clinton polling 50 percent and Donald Trump polling 45 percent, for example, if you have a four percent margin of error, that means that although the results say Hillary Clinton 50, she may actually be at 46 or may actually be at 54 and that the sort of same four point swing would exist for the numbers of uh, Donald Trump. Is that a useful and or accurate understanding of margin of error? I think it's a partial understanding. Let me put a little finer point on it. When we're talking about the margin of error, we're truly talking about what would happen if we repeated the same sample or the same poll over and over and over. Would we find that we would get the actual value, the actual amount of support amongst all the voters, what we call the entire population, 95 out of 100 times. That's when we talk about the 95% confidence interval. So it's really about whether or not, given the fact that we're only sampling a small number of people, can we do that? So yes, what you are correct when you describe it is that our confidence of what that true, whether or not the true population, the true value as we think of it for the support for Hillary or the support for Trump has got to be within that range. And so when we say, if we look at the lower end of the confidence interval for Hillary and the higher end of the confidence interval for Trump, if those two overlap, then we usually say we can't be confident that those two things are anything different than a statistical tie from the pure statistical standpoint. That's the way I like to think of it. And the reality is right now, given where most of the poll numbers are in this election, we're finding generally that we're within the margin of error for a number of the polls. And then there are a few where uh, it's statistically Hillary Clinton is ahead. OK, now you mentioned at the beginning that an individual poll's importance is smaller, but that an average of polls can be a better way to sort of interpret poll data in terms of its predictive value. Back in 2012, and I say this not to pat myself on the back because many, many people did this. I had a 100 percent correct electoral map, and all I did was look at an average of state polls and say, OK, if the average in Pennsylvania is that President Obama is ahead, I'll fill that in blue, so on and so forth. And many people sort of did this. Is that uh, is that surprising to you when we look at basically 50 individual elections in a presidential election? And can you talk about some of the ways in that looking at the average of polls might lead you astray? Sure. So first thing I would say is that, well, first, congratulations on getting 50, right? <laughs> um, the, the reality is probably 38 of those were pretty much most people could get right before looking at any polls. And it's probably the last 12 that is really where the differences are. And that's not meant to diminish your accomplishment. I'm mm. just saying as a practical matter. No, diminish away you know, by all means. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the first thing is that those 12, you know, probably 12 states, what we always call sort of the battleground states are usually the ones that make a difference. You raise the very important point that we get these national poll numbers every day. Oh, nationally, here's what the numbers show. But what really matters is the electoral college. And one of the other interesting things about the whole margin of error discussion, which directly ties to this, is that a margin of error is calculated on the total number of respondents in the poll. But let's say we cared about voters in the state of New York, and we only had 30 New York voters in a sample with 1,000 people. Well, the margin of error on the New York estimate is much, much larger. It's only based on those 30 people. You never hear people, or very rarely have I seen people report that the margins of errors get much, much larger if you look at any subgroup in a poll. So national polls are somewhat limited in their value in terms of actually predicting electoral college, particularly when you think about the specific states. So the first thing that I think is a really valid point is looking closer at state polls, a very useful thing, I think, for a consumer to do. Now, with respect to averages, I have kind of mixed feelings on this. Um, averages can be powerful. And when you have so many polls, there are times where looking across the averages at least tell you something a little bit more long term about trends, tends to take out the sort of extreme values and the like. One of the problems with those averages, though, is that there is no margin of error calculated ever on those polls. And most of the averages just assume all polls are of equal quality. But I can tell you that when you actually look at the questions that some of these polling agencies ask, there are some that are very reputable and there are some that are not. And that's actually a really big issue. I was looking at one today from 2012 um, where an agency had asked um, Republican voters if they were in favor of bombing Agrabah. 
And 30% said yes. Well, Agrabah is the town from the movie Aladdin. And they sort of had this big elaborate joke about, oh, 30% of Republican voters support bombing Agrabah. Right. When I looked back at the questions, they had eight questions all about 9-11 and terrorist attacks right before it. They asked the same questions of Democrats, and the questions were much more limited, uh, basically about presidential candidates, and then the question. <laughs> and so polling can really, you know, bad poll questions still exist. So don't think that all polls are created equal. They are not. And remember, those averages basically incorporate everything into one big average number. John, real quick in the limited time we have left for our audience who wants to look into some examples of how the same data can be used to paint drastically different pictures of reality. Do you have some favorite examples that people could look or research about how uh, representations of statistics can reflect the data, but be very, very misleading? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I actually that's a big part of my book, Every Data. You know, I didn't write the book to sort of be a purely political commentary. In fact, many of the examples in the book are about sort of everyday examples of times where people have misrepresented data, uh, either graphically with numbers and the like. And we have everything in the book from why you shouldn't trust representations like four out of five pediatricians prefer a certain baby food <laughs> to why um, why when you read a story that says eating gr grilled cheese will improve your sex life, you don't necessarily want to run out and start eating grilled cheese, at least not based on the statistics. So um, I would point that that's where a lot of it is. I also have launched recently, in addition to my book website, I also have a blog purely on these political issues um, off of johnhjohnsonphd.com. And that's a good place to find all sorts of examples where I've been talking about all these same polling issues we discussed today. Very, very important stuff for anybody who wants to be uh, an informed and competent consumer of not only news, but also uh, advertising, which is where you hear so many of these uh, misleading statistics used. The book is Every Data, the misinformation hidden in the little data you consume every day. We've been speaking with the book's co-author, John Johnson. So great to talk to you. Thank you. Great talking to you, too. Thank you.